Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Um, for a bit of context, I'm filming this between uh, Christmas and New Year, uh, specifically New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. Um, and coming into January 2022, the Canon 1DX Mark III is going to be celebrating its second birthday. Now, I was quite late jumping on the bandwagon for the uh, 1DX Mark III. It was a camera that I've had my eye on since its release date and the pretty extraordinary price tag was something that was massively off-putting as it would be to most people who aren't professional users or aren't sponsored by Canon. I was quite fortunate enough to um, be able to stumble across uh, a pretty significant bargain really. There was a refurbished uh, 1DX Mark III that had quite a few thousand knocked off uh, the ASK or the original listing price when it was brand new. And I ended up part chopping my Canon 5D Mark IV and a few other accessories in um, for this 1DX Mark III and was quite fortunate where I didn't have to put too much of a substantial contribution uh, towards it in cash, uh, which has been quite nice because the 1DX Mark III is a huge, huge step up from the 5D Mark IV. Now, in this video today, I'm going to be taking you through the video and setup that I use for YouTube. Uh, we're going to look into some of the specs of the 1D Mark III or uh, 1DX Mark III and uh, have a look to see how it compares uh, up against the camera that I was using before, which was the 5D Mark IV. Now, if you've seen my intro video or the previous video I've done, where I've spoken about the custom PC that I've made. Tech is something that I'm hugely interested in and find myself spending more and more time looking into and researching. One of the things I've seen online, or one of the topics I've seen online, should I say, regarding the 1DX Mark III is there seems to be quite a lot of negativity towards it from more, I don't want to use the term professional YouTubers, but more well-known YouTubers, let's say, where they were hating on the fact that they'd removed the conventional low frame rate 1080p video settings. Now, my opinion on that is a, maybe a little bit controversial in some people's opinion. At the end of the day, if you're going to go and spend seven grand on a camera, which is what the list price of the 1DX Mark III is, even now, two years after it was released, then you should be aware of the settings and the specifications of the camera. It was something I looked into a hell of a lot. And, you know, the low frame rate 1080p video settings wasn't really something that appealed to me anyway. I wanted to shoot everything in minimum 4K, uh, preferably 4K 60 frames per second. Uh, but you've also got the option with the 1DX Mark III to shoot in 5.5K RAW, which is, it, don't get me wrong, it generates massive file sizes that are quite difficult to handle and you will need a powerful computer to be able to do that but for me you know Canon have released the 1DX Mark III is their flagship camera you know even regardless of all of the mirrorless cameras that are now becoming more and more popular the 1DX Mark III is Canon's top of the range business end camera and you've got to think to yourselves if they're marketing a camera that's seven grand why are they going to be interested in necessarily putting low frame rate video options on their flagship camera? They're going to be going for the, the high end stuff and I think at the time when the 1DX Mark III came out in January 2020, they were one of the you know the leaders in the really high resolution um, video settings. Okay, you've got, don't get me wrong, you know, you've got your red cameras and you've got your high-end Sonys, which are comparative price points. Um, but the Sony's a mirrorless camera, it's not got as many features as what the 1DX Mark III has got. And the red cameras are specifically built for video. They, they're not a combination of um, DSLR, uh, you know, actual cameras, uh, you know, and, and, and the 1DX Mark III has got the option where you can also use uh, you know, use it to take pictures, whereas the the red cameras and uh, and whatnot are, you know, more predominantly focused towards 
specifically shooting video. Not to mention, products like the RED cameras, you need to buy thousands worth of accessories to be able to get to the point where it's a usable video camera. The 1DX Mark III, okay granted, yeah, you need a lens, but everything else, it comes out of the box ready to shoot and ready to go. Now, my YouTubing setup is significantly better than most people's, but also could be significantly worse than other people's as well, obviously depending on the, the equipment you use. Um, the setup I'm using at the minute has been sort of bodged together a little bit because I spent all my budget on on the actual camera and uh, didn't think about tripods or anything like that to support it with. So it's currently sitting on a Joby Gorillapod. Uh, this is the more beefy version of the um, knobbly bendy uh, Gorillapod that supports, I think it's up to about 5.5 kilos of camera weight, which um, believe it or not, the myself is probably getting on for the, the higher end of that. Uh, I use a Pro Media Gear VRC1 um, L shape, or I think it's a C shape cage, that basically holds all of the ancillary parts onto the camera. So there's the microphone, there's the monitor, uh, which is actually really handy when you're recording face to face pieces like this. It enables me to make sure that my face is uh, in focus, uh, and I can also monitor the audio levels as well uh, on the monitor with the microphone that's built onto the that's built onto the cage. Uh, speaking of microphones, I'm currently using a Rode, um, I, don't know, I don't know what model of microphone it is, it was um, one that I bought off Amazon, it was I think about 45 quid, so not overly expensive, but it's good enough for what I need it for, and the audio quality versus uh, using it and using the built-in microphone to the camera is significant. Um, that connects to the camera via a 3.5mm headphone jack, just slots straight into the side nice and easy to set up there's no uh, no additional work that's um, that's required there's no balancing of audio that's needed don't get me wrong that can all come along in post-production but for the actual um, in terms of plugging it into the camera and going it's dead easy um, the monitor is it is the base range one of what uh, Atomus provide uh, it's the five inch Shinobi now there are other options for Atomus where you can record uh, externally to the camera, so you can you, you can use the camera for video and record to externally to a hard drive. Those are quite a bit more expensive than the monitor that I got. Mine was, like I say, it's the it's the base model of the range, so I think I paid uh, 400 quid for the monitor and an accessory kit that came with it, so extra batteries, cables, etc. Um, and I've got to say, it's it's absolutely fantastic. I'm obviously you'll see now my eyes aren't looking at the lens they're looking at the monitor that's above it and it's bright I think it operates at peak thousand nit brightness so it's really really clear during the day it's absolutely fantastic for indoor settings like what we're what we're uh, using at the minute and it was I had a choice I, I did have a DJI Ronin gimbal before and I I couldn't afford to go and buy the monitor on its own and, and keep the gimbal so I sold the gimbal in favour of buying the monitor and I've actually found myself using my camera a hell of a lot more with this monitor than I did before when I had the gimbal. Don't get me wrong, the DJI Ronin gimbal was absolutely fantastic and it's really transformed how my video footage looks, obviously from um, shaky footage when handheld, obviously there's inbuilt camera stabilisation but it's still doesn't completely take away the camera shape whereas the gimbal completely eradicated it um, but I just found it was too heavy it was too cumbersome it's too bulky to really take anywhere to use particularly if you're going out for the day anywhere um, but you know it's personal preference and like I say I, I personally find myself using my camera a hell of a lot more now I've got this monitor and I also find that my footage is a lot sharper and a lot clearer because you've got the bigger screen that you can articulate anywhere you like uh, and gives you a much better idea as to whether your subject is in focus. A lot of the footage that I'd shot before getting this monitor, uh, I found that I wasn't out of focus, but it wasn't quite as sharp as what it could have been. Uh, in addition to that, I'm currently shooting this video on a Canon 50mm prime lens. 
I've got this lens and two other lenses that are um, telephoto lenses. One's a 16 to 35, and the other's a 24 to 105. Now, obviously, different focal lengths have a different effect on how they make the human face and they make the uh, object of the video appear. My personal favourite lens for shooting is this 50mm lens I find. Um, I'm not going to use the term photogenic because I'm far from photogenic, but uh, I've, I personally prefer the way that the 50mm lens makes uh, subjects look, particularly people and particularly me when I'm recording um, piece to camera videos like this. Now, there is obviously a couple of downsides to the 1DX Mark III. One of which is the price point that we've already, or that I've already discussed. Uh, the second of which, and I completely understand why Canon did it, it's the memory card options that are used for the camera. Now, my 5D Mark IV took a compact flash card and it took a SD card, which are both relatively cheap, relatively inexpensive forms of flash memory. The 1DX Mark III takes CF Express cards, which are astronomically expensive, and I had to sell one of my kidneys in order to be able to afford one. I'm only joking, I didn't really, but um, it works out roughly, uh, depending on the manufacturer, roughly one pound per gigabyte of memory space. So in my camera, I've got 128 gigabyte um, SanDisk CF Express card. Now, you need the CF Express cards because the, the write speeds for the cards um, uh, high enough in order to be able to record 5.5k raw footage. Uh, I think I've got one here. Uh, I don't know if you can see that pretty well, it's too far away and not in focus, but I've done a really bad job of showing that. Um, this is a 128 gigabyte card, and the read speed for this is 1700 megabytes per second, and the write speed is, I need to get my glasses on, uh, the write speed is 1200 megabytes a second. So fairly significant read and write speeds. And this is the cause for this, you know, the, the really high prices for the card. You know, when you look at it, I've got a 128 gig card and I've got a 512 gigabyte card in the camera at the minute. So, you know, you, you're talking getting on for seven, 800 megabytes, uh, sorry, 800 uh, gigabytes of memory card. And that equates to you know, getting on for 800 quid of, you know, tangible cash, which is, um, a bit of a bit of pill to swallow, uh, and all in make the, you know, if you were going to go out and buy this camera from scratch and pay full retail price for it, you know, you're not going to be getting a lot of change out of ten grand in order to be able to get a usable, photographic video setup. Never mind a, um, you know, if you were looking at buying this as, looking to set up as a videographer, you're going to be needing to spend, you know, a, a fair few thousand in order to be able to get a usable kit. That said, however. The video footage is absolutely fantastic, or video quality is absolutely fantastic from this camera. Uh, I predominantly use 4K 60 frames per second for recording um, YouTube videos and you know, for, you know various bits and bobs around the house. Downsides to that are in the 5.5K RAW mode and 4K 60 frames per second mode, um, autofocus is disabled. So in situations like this, you might see if I'm getting closer and further away from the camera with the prime lens, the quality, the focus on my face is adjusting slightly. Um, so obviously that's a downside. Ideally, situations like this, it would be nice to have it where you've got the autofocus on every single um, video uh, recording mode possible. At least that way you've got the option where you can disable it or enable it. Personally, I prefer it to be enabled because, you know, like I say, if you, you know, I'm, I'm moving, I'm sat on the floor at the minute, so it's not the most comfortable place. Um, but I'd like to make sure that my head was perfectly in focus, whether I move from the camera, move to the side, move forwards, backwards, etc. So it's not without its faults, but from uh, coming from a 5D Mark IV user to a 1DX Mark III user, um, it's night and day different. There's a lot of people that I've seen out there on the internet that are asking the question, is it worth the money? Should I get one? Shouldn't I get one? Um, my take on all technology is buy the best piece of equipment that you can afford. It's an incredibly fast moving market and it's an incredibly competitive market, not just in cameras, but technology as a whole. 
I personally look after all my tech like I look after my newborn son. I treat it with a lot of care, treat it with a lot of respect. And for me, you know, I'm going to keep this camera and I'll have this camera for the next probably five, six years, maybe even longer. Um, the build quality on it is absolutely fantastic. It's built like a tank. Obviously, you know, don't get thrown against walls or dropping it off, you know, floors or anything like that. But it's very rugged, very robust, and overall is probably, I would say, yeah, I'm getting on for my favourite piece of tech, um, which is no easy accolade to um, to get. So I spoke quite a bit about the video capabilities of the 1DX Mark III. But obviously, as I mentioned as well, this is essentially a DSLR camera. Um, I'm going to post some pictures, um, you know, up in this video, so you can see the kind of sort of um, image quality that you get from it. It's got a 20 megapixel camera, obviously being Canon's DSLR or flagship DSLR. It's a full frame sensor. Now, the 5D Mark IV had a 30 megapixel sensor. Now, you'd automatically think that, well, more megapixels better picture quality, why is Canon gone backwards? Canon hasn't gone backwards. What you need to look at is it's not just the um, sensor, it's the quality of the processor that's in the camera as well. The 5D Mark IV had a Digi 6 processor, I think. The 1DX Mark III's got a Digi 10. Now there's four years in between the 5D Mark IV release date and the 1DX Mark III release date. Four years in today's world in terms of technology is might as well be light years because the way that this camera processes images and processes light versus the way that the 5D Mark IV processed um, images is completely different. It's far superior uh, and I also find that when you're shooting in Canon Log you end up with much more post-production capabilities on the 1DX Mark III versus the, the 5D Mark IV. Uh, and like I say, this camera for me is an absolutely phenomenal piece of kit. I just wish that I could re uh, record uh, videos well enough for YouTube that uh, are, are good enough to do it justice. Now, obviously that will come in time. Um, and I also wish that I'd be able to um, have far better editing skills for the post-production than what I've currently got. Um, because I really do feel at the minute that I've got the kit to do the job, but the only part that's letting it down is me, which is uh, something that definitely needs to be worked on, and something that I intend to spend a lot more time and a lot more effort on in 2022. So that's probably should be it for this video today then guys. Uh, I apologise for this video again, like most of my videos I intended to be fairly brief, but it's probably rumbled on for well over 10 minutes now. Uh, if you've enjoyed hearing me talk about my camera and you know talking about my passions for technology again, give the channel a like, give me a subscription. But until then, I'll see you guys in the next video. Make sure you have a happy new year. Best wishes for the year to come. Until next time.